I'm looking at Second Chronicles 32. Back looking at these kings of Israel and Judah. Been working on this off and on throughout the past few years. And it's been one of the most fun studies I've ever done. I don't see how anybody could neglect looking at these kings of Israel and Judah. You know, I started back in like 2020, 2021 doing the series God's Game of Thrones. And, you know, going through looking at the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And then got led to doing the kings of Israel and Judah. And it's just so fun where the Lord takes you. Just like we're doing the Adventure of the Bible series as well. And each week I don't know where God's going to take me. and then, But then each week he puts a new lesson into my mind to work on. The Bible is like an adventure, and the Lord Jesus Christ is our tour guide, and He's, and if you jump into the Bible, He's taking you down so many different streets and highways and back roads, and you just never know where you're going to end up. And I've been doing Second Kings along with Second Chronicles because, you know, they got a lot of the same thing, but they got a lot of awesome little different nuggets and details that the other one doesn't have and we've about completed second kings by going through the kings of israel and judah and my plan is to get done with the kings of israel and judah and then go back and look at maybe look at king david and then king solomon which i should have done those first but i just wasn't led to do those first but now we're looking at Second Chronicles 32, and it's you know given it's given the same a lot of the same uh, story that we already looked at <clears throat> back in Second Kings, but it's also got some little nuggets and details that the other one didn't have, and also I've got a different thought for this one, and it's about King Sennacherib, Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And as you know, he's uh, the enemy of King Hezekiah, the good king. And I, I don't know if you remember, but a while back I started a series on Bible villains. And, you know, a lot of the series, uh, I'll, I'll do a few lessons on them. But then if, if I feel like it's not going anywhere, I'll, I'll stop them for a while. But this could go right along with that series of Bible villains. Sennacherib would be... One of those Bible villains, he's a type of the Antichrist, and that's what we're going to look at, how Sennacherib reminds us of the devil and the Antichrist. <clears throat> so in chapter 32, in verse 1, it says, After these things, after what things? Well, after Hezekiah has had this victory here in chapter 31, that's where it left off. It says, and thus... In Second um, Chronicles 31, verse 20, And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and wrought that which was good and right, and truth before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, and in the law, and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. So it says, right after that, it says, after these things. So, after a good victory, here comes the devil. Ain't that the way it goes? After these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came. After a victory, here comes the devil. And entered into Judah. He enters into Judah and encamped, and encamped against the fenced cities. That's just like the devil. He's camping out against you. He's patient. He's a serpent. And thought to win them for himself. Notice he's all about himself. There's a lot of people that's all about themselves. What is in it for them? What can they get out of it? And if you're one of those people, you need to get your heart right. And you need to start thinking about others. And it's because 
you know how refreshing it is to get around somebody that's not all about themselves, that's not trying to win the entire day over to themselves? It's a refreshing feeling because everybody's trying to get everything for themselves nowadays. I mean, you go to work, everybody's worried about when they're going to break. Everybody's worried about when they get a promotion, when they get a raise, when when they get something good happening to them. And then when you get something good happening to you, they're mad about it. They're trying to win things for themselves, just like Sennacherib. And Sennacherib's the top of the Antichrist. And look, he's encamped against the fenced cities. He's against Judah, just like the Antichrist. Who's going to be encamped against the Lord's army? He's going to get all his armies of the world, and he's going to encamp and, and gather together against the Lord's army. In Revelation 19, 19, it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And then in uh, Second Chronicles 32, 2, And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem. So Sennacherib, his purpose is to fight against God and his army. The Antichrist will make that his purpose, to fight against God and his army. The devil's made that his purpose, to fight against God and God's people. And you can tell a lot about a person by seeing who they are fighting. You know, when I see somebody that's in straight contradiction and straight contrast to the saints, that tells me a lot about that person. When I see a lot of these celebrities, actors, musicians, and what they're putting out there, like in their song, in their movie, is the opposite of the saints and Christianity and God that says a lot about that person because there was a lot of thought and effort that went into that stuff that they're putting out. You can tell a lot about a person by who they're fighting. I can tell a lot about a person by their comments to the lessons on here or when I'm looking at other preaching on YouTube and I see the comments to those lessons or those sermons and they're fighting the preacher. You know, what spirit is coming from them that's fighting somebody that's promoting their Savior, that's promoting the Savior of the world? What spirit is that? You can tell a lot about a person by who they are trying to fight. And if you're fighting somebody that's putting out the gospel, I don't, I mean, obviously those, those people, that's, everybody that's putting out the gospel, they're a human, they're a person, so they're going to have a lot wrong with them. Because they're still in this flesh. They ain't got a glorified body yet. You know, that's something you need to remember. You're, you're not all that. You're not the greatest thing that God gave to the world, okay? You still got faults. And every Christian in this world is going to have faults. But when you see, uh, when you start fighting against somebody that's putting the gospel out, even if they may be even doing it not with a good attitude, you're fighting against God if you're fighting them. And I don't want that on my record that I'm fighting against somebody that's promoting the Lord Jesus Christ and the right gospel. I don't even care if they're using the wrong Bible. I don't, uh, they may be using the wrong Bible and putting out the right gospel. So I'm going to stay away from fighting against that person. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't stand up for the King James Bible, when they correct it and whatnot, but I'm not going to seek or pick a fight with that person. In Acts 5.39 it says, But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply you be found even to fight against God. So I'm not going to fight against people that are for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the right Jesus Christ, not another Jesus. I'm, I don't want to... Uh, give any support to those who are promoting another Jesus. 
But if they got the right gospel and they're promoting the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I'm for that person. Even if I disagree with them in many ways, or even if I don't like their attitude, or me and their per my personality and their personality just doesn't click, uh, I'm not going to fight against that person. So it says in Second Chronicles 32.3, and he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men. This is Hezekiah. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains, which were without the city, and they did help him. So he, he got the princes and the mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains on the outside of the city. And, you know, he couldn't do that on his own. He needed help. You can't do this. Christian warfare today on your own. You need help. And the reason he's doing this is because he doesn't want Sennacherib and his guys coming in and having that water supply out there as they besiege the city because then they'll uh, be able to stay out there longer. So it says, so there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, why should the king of Assyria come and find much water? So they won't, uh, the king of Assyria and his people, they won't have the fountain of living waters, which is God, and they won't have any extra physical water. So it, their water supply is going to be cut off. And notice it says there was m gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains. You know, the saints need each other. You need other Christians. You need other saints. You see, the devil wants to divide and conquer. He would love to have everybody fighting each other. And, you know, there's people putting out stuff saying that Christians need to separate Christians need to not be together. And they make it seem like there's only just a couple, just a handful of Christians that are right with God and all these other Christians out there are not right with God. So you need to separate from them and be a, on a little island by yourself. That's inspired by the devil so he can divide and conquer. You need to gather together. And I don't mean like the ecumenicals type stuff where you're gathering with people with the wrong gospel and just straight heretical beliefs, but gathering together with other saints who worship the same Lord Jesus Christ and believe, you know, the fundamental things that every Christian ought to believe, the deity of Christ. And you're much stronger when you've got others so there's gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land saying why should the kings of assyria come and find much water so he's cutting off the water supply and you know this is a picture of the tribulation because the lord is going to dry up the water supply in Revelation 16, 12, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. So he he even dries up the water in the tribulation so that that army that's going to go against him can gather together easier. And you know, you got other places where in the tribulation, that water supply is going to be dried up. They're not going to have anything to drink. So you can see the picture here. And, uh, you know, the Bible's written in such a way that you're reading history, but you're also reading prophecy. You know, when you were in history class in school, it might be kind of boring because you were just reading history. But when you're reading the Bible, you're reading history and prophecy. And you're reading something that's going to help you practically. So... They don't want the so Hezekiah doesn't want the king of Assyria and his army to have a lot of water so that they can just stay all refreshed out there while they're trying to kill him. 
And then in verse 5 it says, Also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. So he strengthened himself. Let's look at some verses on strength. It says in 1 Peter 5.10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. God wants to make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Look at that little outline there. Establish, strengthen, settle. He wants to do that for you. And you're going to have a king of Sennacherib come in your life. And if you don't watch it, he's going to get you all shook up. If you don't lean on the Lord, you're not going to have no strength. What does the Bible say? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Uh, what does it say? Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Trust, you got to trust in the Lord or you're not going to have strength. You're not going to be settled. You're not going to be established. You've got to come to a place where these battles that's too big for you, you just say, this is what you do. When you got a battle that's too big for you, this is all you got to do is just keep trying your best and say, God, this is your hands. This is in your hands. You fix it. I'm just going to keep getting up. I'm going to keep reading my Bible. I'm going to keep going to work, doing my best at it. And all those those uh, thoughts and all those battles that come along the way, you handle them the best you can. And But you have in the back of your mind, God's going to fight this battle. He's going to take care of it. And you just keep praying. And that's what you got to do. And that's how you strengthen yourself. And the Lord's going to give you strength and he's going to est establish you and settle you. That will settle you. That will get rid of that uneasy feeling. That will get rid of that anxious feeling. When you got it, when you just say, God, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to put the rest in your hands. That's how you get settled. So he strengthens himself. And what is Philipp, you know, the great verse, you know, I, you, you got it memorized. Don't even have to turn to it. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken. Now, you think about that phrase, built up. And you go over to Jude. Go over to the book of Jude. And verse 20. It says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. You don't want to build up yourself to be some great one. But you want to build up your faith and you want to build up others. He strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken. And you think about, you know, God is not using physical walls today. God's not using physical buildings today. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you need to be building up yourselves on in your faith. You know, maybe you've lost some faith. You need to build up all that's broken. Maybe you've left your first love. Go back and do the things that you did when you first got saved that made you fall in love with the Word of God, that made you fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you can build that wall back up. So it says in 2 Chronicles 32, 5, Also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers. What, what's some verses about a tower? Psalm 144 and verse 2. David talking about the Lord here. And he says, My goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth 
my people under me. So the Lord is your tower. He's your high tower. He is your wall around about you. So Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 32, 5, also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without, so another wall, and raised it up and and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David. I looked up uh, Milo is a wall on the northern side. So he's repairing things that are broken. And you need to get up and examine your life and examine the things that are lacking and repair them. Get them back to where they used to be. Get them back better than they ever were before. He repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. So he's he's preparing. He's preparing for warfare. So he made darts and shields in abundance. And in Ephesians 6.16, talking about our spiritual warfare, it says, Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You see, Hezekiah is making him darts and shields in abundance. He knows the enemy is going to have their own darts and shields in abundance. And we know in this spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. They're going to have darts and shields in abundance. You know, Hezekiah's fight was physical. Ours is spiritual. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 2 Corinthians 10. But we're trying our best to to get to sharpen our sword. Hebrews 4.12, your sword's the word of God. I tell you that all the time because people just don't care about the Bible anymore. They won't get their sword out. They don't have a weapon. They're all concerned with having guns all over the house, but they won't pull out the weapon that they really need. They're concerned with preserving this physical life, but not their spiritual one. So Second Chronicles 32, 6, And he set captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them. So Hezekiah gathers the captains of war and the people and gathered them together in the street right in front of the gate of the city there and spake comfortably to them. Now you... That shows you Hezekiah's character. You can contrast that with King Rehoboam back there that made a mess of things. In 1 Kings 12, 13, it says, And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So, you see, that that ain't going to work. Hezekiah speaks comfortably to them. It leads to a victory. Rehoboam spoke rough to him, and it led to the kingdom splitting. And you know, that reminds me of a verse over in James. James 3.17, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, all those things, that's the way you ought to be. You ought to be kind and sweet and nice to people, speaking comfortably to people. You know, a lot of Christians, they don't have that. They're mean and they're ugly with people. And you know, a lot of, if you talk to like a waitress at a restaurant on Sunday, it might be her least favorite day because that's when all the church people come in. 
They're coming in with their suit and tie on, their nice dresses on. You can tell they've just been to church, and they come in mean and hateful. You know, you, uh, I, when I'm at work, there's a lot of professed Christians. There's a lot of preachers where I work, and they're just as mean as the lost people. But Hezekiah, he's got the right idea. He's speaking comfortably to them. When somebody asks you a question or talks to you, you need to be peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. You need to speak comfortably to them. And look what he says in Second Chronicles 32, 7. He says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid, nor dismayed. And that reminds you of what we just talked about if you've been following along with those Joshua studies. In Joshua 1, 7, what did the Lord say to Joshua? Only be thou strong and very courageous. Over and over, he was telling Joshua, like in Joshua 1, 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. For the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. Hezekiah's got the right idea. Why should we, why should we be afraid of the king of Assyria? Why should we be afraid of this type of the Antichrist? Although Hezekiah, you know, probably didn't know he was the type of the Antichrist. But why should you? Why should we be afraid of him? We've got the God of heaven. We've got all the elect angels on our side. Second Kings 6, 15 through 17. Let's check it out. And it's about Elijah. And it says in Second Kings 6, 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early, and gone forth, behold, an host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? See, he's, he's freaking out because the enemy's horses and chariots is gathered all around him. But look what Elijah says. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And there was only two of them. Elisha and his servant, and they had all those enemies encamped about them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. So think about that. You may feel like you're alone, but if the Lord opened your eyes, you got horses and chariots all around you on your team fighting the Lord's battle. So Hezekiah says, For there be more with us than with him. Hezekiah was relying on the Lord. So here's a really great verse, Second Chronicles 32, 8. With him is an arm of flesh. The biggest, meanest, baddest guy on this planet. It's he's he's all he's got it is a, is an arm of flesh. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those arm wrestler guys. That's become a get it becoming a pretty popular sport now. And you got those guys are super strong, like Devin Lorat. Michael Todd, all those guys. Super strong. John Brzezink. I don't know if you've ever heard of those popular arm wrestler guys. But all they got is an arm of flesh. You know, they could take our arm and just break them off. But it's an arm of flesh. Goliath. Arm of flesh. Pharaoh. Arm of flesh. That's it. The flesh is weak. I don't care how strong it is, it's still weak. And it's it's laughable that we could get so puffed up in our flesh to think that our flesh is something than that it's strong. 
you know, when I'm at work, you know, the longer I do something, the better I get at it. And the better you get at something, the more temptation is there for you to think, well, my flesh is pretty good. So when my when I start thinking, well, I, I'm getting pretty good at this job, start thinking of a time when your flesh was weak so that you don't get puffed up in whatever you're doing. You know, all it takes for me to miss work and become the worst worker is a microscopic stomach bug that forces me to call in and be, uh, have my head in the toilet, throwing up. Just a little microscopic stomach bug to give you an idea how about how weak your flesh actually is if a microscopic stomach bug can take it out. So with him is an arm of flesh. With the king of Sennacherib, that's all he's got. But with us is the Lord God, the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You know why it's good to listen to preaching? Is because when you got a Bible preacher, he can point you to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the one who is your fortress, your high tower, your safety, your shield, and all that you need, and you can rest yourself on those words that he's speaking. That's why it's good to listen to preaching. That's why it's good to read the Bible. You can find these great Bible verses that says, there, for there be more with us than with him, and you can rest on those words and let him establish, strengthen, settle you. Everybody's going around in fear about this eclipse coming up. Ain't that weird? Why would you be afraid of that? Do you not know who made the sun and made that moon and, and made all that stuff up there? That's the God that's in you. Why would you be afraid of what's going to take place during that time? Let the Lord establish, strengthen, settle you. Rest yourself on His words, His promises, and you'll be so much better off. So Hezekiah's like, with him is an arm of flesh. Now, in the trib, in the tribulation, with all this AI stuff, it may be an arm of flesh and iron. Like in the book of Daniel, iron mixed with the miry clay there. Daniel 2, 33 through 34. Check that out for a minute. Daniel 2, 33 through 34. It says his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. But even that, that's nothing. Oh, oh well, iron and flesh, that's nothing. Because look at Daniel 2.34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were part of iron, and brake them to pieces. It broke the image that, that's feet that were part of iron and clay, and brake it to pieces. Jesus Christ is the stone cut without hands. He's the stone cut without hands. That's, that's a picture of the virgin birth. Jesus Christ is that stone. And he's going to break that image in pieces. It don't matter if it's iron and clay. It don't matter if it's iron. So in the tribulation, they're going to have all that AI stuff. Oh, well. Maybe they got an arm of steel. An arm of iron. That's it. With them is an iron of steel. With them is an arm of iron. Oh, well, we got the Lord our God to help us. It don't matter what they got on their arm. It don't matter what their arm is made of. They're still not made of the same stuff that God's made of. It don't matter what happens or what people say and do and their threats. It's all just a bunch of kid stuff. If you think about it, all these people that's, that's just constantly fighting and starting wars and starting junk all the time, that's just like a bunch of kids. Like when you was little, what did you and your siblings do? You fought all the time, and you was trying to take their stuff, and you wouldn't was, was complaining about not sharing and all that. That's all these people are doing. They're overgrown children fighting about stuff, trying to take each other's stuff. Why not just get up and go to work, do the best you can do, enjoy your family, enjoy the Lord, and then go to bed. And then get up and do it over again. That's all you got to do. Just leave people alone. 
You be happy with the portions God, God has given you. And I'll be happy with the portion God has given me. If I see God give you a bigger portion than me, I'm going to be happy for you. If you see give, God give me something, be happy for me. We'll work hard. We'll enjoy our family. And we'll go to bed. We'll serve God and go to bed. That'd be heaven on earth if people did that. And that's the way it's going to be in the millennium. All these people acting like kids. It's just overgrown babies is all it is. Sennacherib is, is just an overgrown baby going around trying to take everybody's stuff. So with him as an arm of flesh, but with us as the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. You know, you need to let the Lord fight your battles. You got a battle coming up. You know, the devil's going to try to make you think, well, God doesn't want to help you. Don't bother God with this. You need to do it on your own. No, God wants to fight the battles for you. God wants you to rely on him. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. After this, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem. But he himself laid siege against Lachish and all his power with him. So he sends his servants over to Jerusalem while he's over here fighting this other battle. And you see, Sennacherib is a busy man. Just like the Antichrist. In Revelation 6, 2, you're going to see the Antichrist. He's on that pale horse. And he's going around conquering, trying to conquer. Conquering and to conquer. That's what he's doing, going around, trying to conquer things. Win things over for himself. Taking what he can take, seeing to get what he can get. So, he's an evil worker. He's a busy man. The devil will use a busy man. Because he can get a lot of things done for him. After this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and unto all Judah that were at Jerusalem. See, that's what the devil wants to do. Put words in people's mouth to discourage you, to get you in fear. So, unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah that were at Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Whereon do ye trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? You see that? He's getting them to question who they trust. Ain't that what the devil did? The first words that came out of the devil's mouth back there in Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The first thing he does is try to put you in doubt, get you to question who you're trusting in and the words that came from the person that you're trusting. You know, at work, a lot of times, people try to get me to question the King James Bible. They find out, and this ain't lost people. This is Christians. Like, lost people, they're, they're more accepting of the Bible than, than a lot of these Christians I work with. And they try to get you to question who are you trusting? And and I just say, you know, I, who? what spirit is coming from you? You know, I'm going around promoting that you can hold the Word of God in your hand and believe it 100%, that it's without error, that you can lean on it 100%. And you're telling me that I can't lean on it 100%. What spirit's coming from you? What spirit's coming from me? I'm promoting faith and trust in the Word of God, and you're trying to take away some of that faith in the Word of God. So that doubt you're trying to put in me, that comes from the serpent. And that's what these servants of Sennacherib are doing. Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, whereon do ye trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? So who am I supposed to trust? You? You old sinner, I'm going to trust you and you being able to correct the word of God and go by what you say instead of just taking what God says and going with it, even if I don't understand it, even if I even if I don't even like it sometimes, you know, because the Bible is going to rub your flesh the wrong way, but I'm still going to take it 
because can two walk together except they be agreed? So, thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, whereon do you trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of, As of Assyria. See, they're laying siege against the, the city there. And, you know, Sennacherib is, you know, pretty much saying, you know, if you go with what Hezekiah is going to say, you're just going to die by famine and thirst in there. You're not going to be able to have food coming in. You're not going to be able to have water. So you might as well just surrender yourself over to me. Why are you trusting in Hezekiah and his God? And the Antichrist, he's going to try to persuade men to take the mark so that they can eat and drink. You know, no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. That's the same thing the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to get them to trust in him and his mark of the beast system instead of trusting in God who will rain down manna from heaven for him. You know, Hezekiah, he's not worried about the uh, Sennacherib here. He's trusting in the Lord as best he can. He says, Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Hath not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? That's true. See, the devil will mix in truth with error. But when he mixes in the truth, he will make the truth look bad on the person given the truth. Hezekiah did take away the high places. Hezekiah did take away the altars where they was offering to false gods. Hezekiah did want them to, to worship before one altar and to worship just the God of heaven. And the, the uh, Sennacherib's wanting to make that look like it's a bad thing. You know, just like Isaiah says over there in Isaiah 5, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, these people today, they're trying to get a negative light on Bible-believing Christians that want what's best for people and, and that worship the God of the Bible. And you know, at first, the Antichrist, he's going to be for all religions. You know, everything's okay. But then he's going to want worship. He's going to come in peaceably, but then he's going to want the worship. And he's going to be like Sennacherib, you know, going against Hezekiah, who's taken away all this bad religion that was going on. You see, the Antichrist, he's going to be okay with all the religions, but he's not going to be with, he's not going to be, I doubt he'll ever be okay with Bible-believing Christians who say there's one way to heaven, there's one God, there's one Bible, There's and all these other ones are wrong. He's not going to be okay with that. So you see how Sennacherib's really showing you the Antichrist, it says in verse 13, Know ye not, this is Sennacherib talking, Know ye not what I and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands. You know, look at what I've done. I'm so special. <clears throat> Were the gods of those nations, of those lands, any ways able to deliver their lands out of my hand? He's saying, you know, look at all these other places I've went forth conquering and to conquer, you see. And I've took all these other places. They weren't delivered by their gods. Yeah, but Sennacherib, those are false gods. You've not went up against the, the Lord God of heaven yet. And it was the Lord God of heaven that was allowing you to take over all that stuff anyway. Now, verse 14, Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of mine hand that your God should be able to deliver you out of mine hand? Look at that. He's exalting himself above all those gods and he's exalting himself above the true God. And you know, what does the Antichrist do in Second Thessalonians? It talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Paul says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin 
be revealed. That's the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Look at this. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, just like Sennacherib exalt him, exalts himself above all that's called God, he basically wants to be God. So you see the resemblance there. Second Chronicles 32, 15. He says, Now therefore let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this manner, neither yet believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of mine hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of mine hand? See, he wants you to think the good guys are the deceivers. He wants you to think the good guys are leading you the wrong way. He's, he's trying to get the people of Judah to think, well, he's defeated all these other places. He's defeated all these other gods. How is my God going to be any different? But their God is different because he's the true God. Verse 16, And his servants spake yet more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. What, what do you see today? They're against God, and then they're against people that promote the true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 17, And he wrote also letters, just like they were dealing with in Second Thessalonians. In Second Thessalonians 2, 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. You see, he's telling them, don't be shaken by letters. And today, don't be shaken by Facebook posts, by articles, by these people that are God-haters. Don't be shaken by these Twitters and Facebook, TikTok stuff that's railing on the Lord. Don't be shaken. But he wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. So you see, he's opening his mouth in blasphemy against the Lord God of heaven. What does the Antichrist do? Well, look at Revelation 13, 4. Or Revelation um, 13, 5. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. He's, he's talking against the Lord God of heaven. Just like Sennacherib is railing on the Lord, speaking against him. What a dangerous place to be in. You're so puffed up, you're talking against the Lord God of heaven. Second Chronicles 32, 18. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them and to trouble them that they might take the city. So they get up there speaking in the Jews' speech. Speaking, with, They're speaking with tongues. They don't speak that language, but they're, they're getting out there now and speaking in the Jews' speech. And you know, 1 Corinthians one twenty two, the, the it says the Jews require a sign. 1 Corinthians 14.22 says tongues are for a sign. And you know that the, the Antichrist or the false prophet, they're going to come with signs and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So they're trying to freak out the Jews speaking in their language to affright them, to trouble them, get them unsettled, unstrengthened. And they spake against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. See, they're talking against the God of heaven just like he's any other God in the earth. Just like atheists want to lump all gods and religions together like they're it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Because there's only, there's one, all the, all the gods are wrong except one. It's a completely different thing. 
And for this cause Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. The third heaven, you see. They're trying to get help from the Lord God. And that's the first thing you need to do. When fear comes, just pray and cry to the God of heaven. So that's what the prophet Isaiah and Hezekiah do. And it says in verse 21, And the Lord sent an angel. So they pray to God about this situation. And the Lord sent an angel, which cut off all the mighty men of valor, and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land, and when he was coming to the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. Then that was quick. In Second Kings nineteen thirty five, it it says that this was the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is a pre appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here it says an angel, and over there it says the angel of the Lord. So you know, when I hear most people go over this they say they they talk as if it was just a regular angel that did this and uh, you know every time it says the angel of the lord it doesn't always refer to the pre-incarnate appearance of jesus so uh, it I, I don't really know what to say it is here i personally think it was a a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord, and not just a regular angel. I, I believe the angel of the Lord personally, the Lord Jesus Christ came down and whooped up on him here because it's a picture of the uh, second coming, in my opinion. And the, the angel of the Lord came down and cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame a face to his own land. And see, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back in flame and fire taking vengeance. And you know, and over there in Second Kings 19.35, this, the angel of the Lord came down and killed 185,000 of them. And Sennacherib goes back to his own land. He went back to where he came from. But he's, he's not, still not worshiping the right God. He's still not worshiping the God of heaven. And you would think after all this, a man would wake up and worship the right God, but he comes to the house of his God. Well, his God couldn't deliver him from the true God. Yet earlier he was bashing all, all the gods. What a hypocrite. So he came forth of his own bowels. So they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. So his own sons killed him. You know, you would think he would have turned to God for models. Like 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 talks about. But no, he doesn't. And he gets killed with the sword. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ is going to show up at the second coming. And, and it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's going to have a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth at that second coming. The Antichrist is going to be defeated and cast into the lake of fire. It said in verse 22, Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and guided them on every side. So they went to the Lord in prayer. And he came through for him. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. And he temporarily lets that get him puffed up. And in those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord. And he spake unto him and he gave him a sign. And remember what that sign was. We talked about it last time. The sign... That was that was given was the shadow on Ahaz's sundial going back 10 degrees. And we went into all that. But you see, these earthly treasures and, and fame and how he was magnified, it led him to, to getting prideful temporarily. And, and stuff will do that to you if you don't watch it. But in those days, he got sick unto death and 
you know, he he's getting uh, he's going to humble himself. But Hezekiah, we'll see that he actually gets kind of puffed up two times. The sickness humbles him, and then he has to get humbled again later. But Hezekiah wondered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. And we talked about last time how this uh, event here where he gets sick could actually take place a little bit before the defeat of Sennacherib. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. His heart just got lifted up in it. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And like I said last time, that could be referring to the Lord taking out Sennacherib for him, the wrath of the Lord not coming on him, because he took out Sennacherib for him. So he humbles himself. That's the difference between him and Sennacherib. He'll humble himself, Sennacherib wouldn't. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasures for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels. You know, I, I believe Hezekiah really loved material things, just like most of us do, and it, there would be times where he set his affection on those things. And it says in verse 28, storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. You see, he's he's uh, he's getting all this stuff and it's easy to get puffed up in it and easy to get your affection on all this. It says, moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance for God. Uh, for God had given him substance very much. You know, everything you got, God gave it to you. Don't get puffed up in it. Just thank God for what he's given you and realize that you got it because of God and not because of yourself. You know, Nebuchadnezzar went rocking around his, his kingdom, his palace, whatever, and he was like, look at all this that I've got for myself, you know. And the Lord had to humble him. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gahan and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. You know, that, that, upper, that upper water course of Gahan, I looked that up and it says a 1,700 foot long tunnel below Jerusalem cut through solid rock. And it redirect, redirected water from the Gahan Spring outside of Jerusalem um, toward the south of Jerusalem into the Pool of Siloam. Uh, that, that's what I read there. Uh, it says, How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon... Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. So the wonder it's talking about is the, the Babylonians were big in astronomy, and they probably observed the sun's phenomenon it had going on when it backed up 10 degrees. Like we talked about in Second Kings twenty, twelve through nineteen, we you know the sign that was given to uh, Hezekiah when the shadow on Ahaz's sundial went backward ten degrees. So they probably saw that themselves and were like, "What's going on here?" And they wanted to go find out about that. So, how be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon? who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. So you see, he, God will leave some stuff in your life to try you, that he might know all that's in your heart. 
And you're like, well, I thought God know, knew everything. Well, he does know everything, but it's it's more for your benefit than it is for his, you see. Just like he knew that Abraham would go and sacrifice Isaac, it was more for Abraham's benefit to try Abram's faith. God knew the outcome. Uh, God knew that Adam and Eve would eat, eat off the wrong tree. He does things for their benefit. He knew that, um, you know, he asked Adam, he's like, where are you? And, you know, he said, what, is, what have you done? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat of? He, he knew all the answers to this stuff. He was, he was asking Adam for his benefit. You know, God will leave stuff in your life to try you and to make your faith better and to show you what you're made of. And he's doing it for your benefit more so than he is for his. So, it says that he might know all that was in his heart. Now, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness. Hezekiah, a really good king compared to most of them. The rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness. Behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah, the prophet. And we got into Isaiah last time we talked about Hezekiah because in Isaiah 36 through 39, it's about Hezekiah. You know, God dedicated a lot of chapters to Hezekiah. It says, Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Remember, Isaiah is the son of Amos, not Amos the minor prophet Amos, but a different one. And in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And we've already went over the lessons about Hezekiah in the book of the kings in 2 Kings 18 through 20. But there's quite a few chapters that talk about King Hezekiah. It says in verse 33, And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did, did him honor at his death. And Manasseh his son reigned in his stead. So the burial, big thing for them. And it says Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. And we'll get into Manasseh next time.